our classrooms are in a crisis i don't know if you agree with this or not but certainly the last two years of the pandemic has split the classroom wide open you know as teachers and as educators we all felt very excited actually very exhilarated not at the prospect of working from home but uh, at the prospect of innovating um because the challenges in front of us were many we had to reach out in space and time and engage invisible students who inevitably put their cameras off and so we had to innovate a lot we had to figure out everything that we did to be successful at what we did but by the look of sheer fatigue and exhaustion in my students eyes i realized that perhaps nothing could really substitute the pleasures of social interaction now clearly critical questions needed to be asked where is this classroom that i occupy who belongs to it who has access to it what is its nature and what are even the ways in which we are learning today now a favorite film of mine satyajit ray's aparajito made in the 1950s in still very newly independent india they ironically captures for us what it means to learn in the indian context the film follows the journey of opu the main protagonist who leaves behind his village his only living relation his mother to seek a higher education to seek better opportunities in the city of kolkata <clears throat> of course it was the village that introduced him to the wonders of science to the mysteries of far off places such as africa but nevertheless opu decides that he has to go to kolkata really to find who he is and in doing this the film really gave us a metaphor what is that metaphor that to discover you have yourself you have to journey to the city now cut to the 2000 and this piece of filmic metaphor that is this the city where you discover yourself holds true for me too here i am in delhi my own jhola in hand in pursuit of my own dreams and like me i who had grown up incidentally in a steel township called durgapur a warm cocoon but afforded little else like me many others too had left behind their homes in suburban towns in tier 2 cities villages even perhaps to travel to various cities in different parts of india and perhaps even beyond for those perhaps who you may say were lucky now why does this happen and how does this happen cities are essentially growth machines they attract resources they attract people they attract capital and therefore they are hubs of opportunity but more interestingly they are also places where you meet strangers they are meeting places for strangers and in encountering this strangeness these differences different ways of being different ways of doing things different perspectives different points of view you grow as a person now this really here uh is where for me the city and the classroom really go here because the classroom too is a space where you discover yourself the classroom is a space where you converse with others collaborate with others i don't know how many of you will have had the unique opportunity of experiencing such a classroom but it is really the space where you learn to take help from others you are challenged by oh god who is this person uh why is he doing this in such way such a way you encounter the strangeness that is your teacher itself so the classroom really ideally is a space of self discovery it is also a space of meeting others who are very different from you but in reality our classrooms are actually plagued by the hierarchy honest admission between the educator and the learner and even among learners 
we are marked by the fault lines of caste, class, gender and several other biases. Meanwhile, what do have our learners done? They have left all of this behind, it doesn't matter, and gone on to enroll in online courses. If they're seeking informational content, all you need to do is search for it online. You can enroll in an online course, acquire the latest cutting edge case studies, learn the most exciting things, have access to great resources, reading material. Many of them offer skills training. Where does the institution linked classroom stand then? In short, what are we here for? And what is the role of the teacher? in this distinct but definitive shift in learning cultures. Are our institutions actually in danger or at risk of being only places of certification, validation and perhaps even branding that we graduate from so and so place so it looks good on our CVs? Is that what this has come to? It's a very sobering thought, especially for me because I'm passionate about what I do. And perhaps there are no easy or definitive answers to any of this. But to consider for a while and really think what the alternatives are and to really rethink our approaches to teaching in general and education more broadly. I offer the power of exploratory classrooms. Because these classrooms offer resources for critical thinking, for innovative and creative problem solving approaches skills to read and think against the grain and these abilities, these will distinguish, this will be truly the mark, the hallmark of an excellent classroom, online or otherwise, physically and otherwise. Now, understandably cities are the very stuff of, you know, study in an urban education curriculum, be it a school of planning, school of urban architecture, so on and so forth. But can cities be resourceful for, say, a humanities education or a liberal arts education or for the management sciences, for example? To me, a city is an idea. It is a political and administrative system. It is lived context. It is where uh, it houses several cultural ecologies. It is the playground for many a creative media practitioners. Uh, it has been the muse for many writers, many filmmakers, many artists. So in short, the city is amenable from any disciplinary exploration. Let me illustrate this for you. Now, context sensitivity is a skill that you require across, across the board. Whether you're making a decision, whether you're building a bridge, whether you're designing a process, whether you're speaking to your consumer, this is a valuable skill to have. And what better than Charles Courier's design of the Gandhi Smarak Sangrahalaya in our very own Sabarmati Ashram in Ahmedabad to learn lessons in context sensitivity from. Now the brief to Korea was very simple. Design a memorial to Gandhi. But Korea knew that his challenge was that he had to embody Gandhi in built form. As visitors, we had to experience Gandhi. So what does he do? He builds a human scaled design of the Sangrahalaya so that when you enter the space, it is diminutive, but you experience Gandhi's human-centered philosophy and political practice. The choice of his building materials reflect Gandhi's own emphasis on industry, sustainability, Swadeshi. And of course, if you notice in this image, all the exhibition halls of the museum are clustered very close together, reminding you of the cultural landscape of Gujarat, the huts in a bunny village. Quite a nod to the context within which the Sangrahalaya is located. Let me give you another example. The diasporic, uh, the stories from the diasporic communities located in Ahmedabad, settled in Ahmedabad for a very long time. To give you an example from one of uh, a project that I did, with the Malayali diasporic community. Now, many of them came to the city with all their possessions packed in a single trunk, an Irimbapetti, they called it. And they arrived here to launch successful businesses, flourishing careers, so much so that future generations also chose to settle down here. What can we learn from these narratives of inclusivity? 
more importantly, how do we make sure that we preserve them for posterity and for all populations concerned in the city of ours? Ahmedabad has been at the site of many a urban re- uh, makeover, many a urban renewal programs and revitalization schemes we have witnessed as citizens of the city. What better than this than to learn how to identify visible stakeholders and perhaps invisible stakeholders? those that emerge much later into the project and then by then usually it is too late and therefore to learn participatory ways of engaging and communicating with them so as you can see the city actually has many resources many rich resources to offer for learning skills approaches ideas concepts across the board and of course some of these may be more amenable to my classroom which is a communications classroom at mica where questions of context audience stakeholders science and science systems are important things to teach but i do truly believe that they are offer up resources for a whole lot of people now <laughs> this is all very well of course but the reality of our urban lives i'm i'm quite sure we all experience this on a daily basis is a very complex negotiation between a grim everyday city and the aspirational promotional city truth be told our grim city our everyday cities are marred by traffic snarls by bad roads in some parts by inadequate resources and all the urban inequities that this foster but of course we all love our city our idea of the city is the aspirational city everything from dilchata hai to bangalore days it is a city where we want to live a modern and cosmopolitan life lead the good life so our urban lives are a complex negotiation between these two versions of the city in our head and in our lives but i find that when classrooms use this dissonance and they create engagement around it to really hone skills in creative problem solving or in critical thinking we foster as educators and co-learners we foster independent thinking minds and interesting points of view let me illustrate this for you so a couple of years ago i launched a course on visual cultures largely centering on the city of amdavad where the task of the course was really in execution of a visual intervention assignment what was this assignment that students had to identify a space or a place in which they would intervene this space or place could be anywhere it could be a mall it could be a suburb it could be a dilapidated neighborhood it could be an interesting significant historical building that nobody visits or sees it could be a heritage site it could be our very own pores of amdavad students had to identify just such a space and intervene in it why an intervention now intervention is when you are responding to the dominant logic of a place or a space and this intervention can take any form it can be a remaking you can offer to remake that place you can respond to the core logic of that place you can offer alternative use to it you can challenge it and of course in that way many of my students uh explored their own versions of the spaces that they chose to invest in intervene in so some here as you can see um uh, wanted to explore the scope of art or the role of art in a public urban lives and this took the form of an art installation which they carried to marketplaces and public parks of course the outcomes of the study were very interesting they wanted to some of them wanted to explore and this is rinjim and shruti the first one was um kanj and others this is rinjim and shruti who wanted to explore the scope of reading as a form of public leisure and nupur and uh, ishita wanted to stage a momentary brief act of healing in a dilapidated administratively neglected part of our city some wanted to raise questions about menstruation the invisibility of menstruation in our daily lives some wanted to raise awareness and throw light upon our collective blindness at garbage and litter in many public spaces in our city so so on so forth there can be many ways in which this can go on 
But the point is, interestingly, for me as a teacher, the outcome was not important. What was important was the process. For so what did they learn in the process? In the process, they learned to map a place. They learned to listen to a place. They learned to listen to its rhythms. They learned to understand how a place evolved over a period of time. They learned to capture the place's ethos. They also learned to ask critical questions of that place. Who uses that place? Who manages it? Who owns it? Who has access to it? Who does not have access to it? And why? And in so doing, my students were able to, in a way, imagine for themselves and for others ways of collaborating with each other, ideating with each other, which they, of course, in general enjoy. But this is the opportunities that is afforded in classrooms, typically and ideally. My real sort of dream, what I'd really like to do, is to really take the classroom out into the city. Ideally, I'd like to just take a stool, go to a park, turn it upside down, and collect around me like-minded people or anyone who just wishes to learn or listen from a master list of great books, great essays, great stories, great films, and share ideas, the most radical concepts, the most interesting ideas that have shaped humankind. This is what I would like to do. And really free the question of education from academic walls. Now, it's not a unique thing. It's been done before. Uh, friends in Brisbane have conducted their own free university in Brisbane where they meet every night, every other night in a, a park, in a, a parking lot, and a larger crowd than ever before joins in sharing food, sharing conversation, sharing ideas. Not listen to a talk or a lecture, but to discuss what they have read and what they have learned. This is really what I would like to do. And this is what really would disengage the question of education and learning from the question of monetization. I believe that all of us, this should be our common project, to really take learning from beyond our academic walls and make it a question of our urban commons. That is the project that I believe we all should be working on.